Hello and welcome to Business Reporter's Digital Transformation Campaign. I'm Alistair Greener and today I'm talking to Pascal Heenans from Radware. Good morning. Good morning. We hear from the experts that machine learning, AI, IoT, all of these technologies are going to be wonderful technologies to help us beat the cybercrime race. We're going to sort out automation with it. Yet, despite all of this, we're still getting many breaches. So what's going wrong? Why is the contradiction there? Businesses are moving more and more towards the cloud. They're migrating to the cloud. And by migrating to the cloud, they're actually creating more targets. Sometimes that migration doesn't go with all the security um, reflection that they should be using. And from there, they create more exposed services in the cloud. And then you have on the other side, on the darker side, uh, you have those attackers that are getting ever more automated which means that they can find automatically targets and you will see an increase in the number of attacks that are going on on those targets. When you think about migrating to the cloud, you think about taking your on-prem services and put them with a hoster that is a public cloud provider. In doing so, you will go through transformation to make them more efficient because the idea is to be operational, operationally more efficient. So what you do is you take those servers that are typically on-prem, they had permissions for users and loose permissions on-prem you can get away with because you are protected by a castle. You have like a model that is like a castle, you have your servers in there, whoever's inside the castle can access those servers, so your only threat was inside a threat. Now take those services, move them into the cloud, and then suddenly that castle is gone. So those servers are now publicly exposed and every permission that is too loose will be an opportunity for a hacker to get access to data. And talk a little bit more about the hacker becoming more sophisticated. What's happening there? The hackers are not getting more sophisticated, but they're getting more automated. The nation states and organized crime, they're getting much more sophisticated, as you said. I agree with that. But on the other side, the most dangerous one for most of our businesses are the ones who are opportunistic, who want to make a quick buck. And they want to do that by renting out services like booter and stressor services, which allow people to come in and order a DDoS attack onto a victim and bring down or make his site unavailable. So those kind of attackers now have access to source code, which allows them to build botnets. So in October of 2016, there was an event caused by Mirai, so the attacks on Krebs and OVH and also the Dyn attacks. Just before the Dyn attacks, the, the actor behind Mirai published his code or leaked his code on hacker forums. And from there, it was published on the internet. So now all hackers have access to a fully functional botnet. A botnet that is not sophisticated. If you compare it with Windows botnets or Windows malware, Windows malware by far is much more sophisticated. But the nature of the devices that it's, it's attacking, they are so vulnerable and so easy to exploit that the botnet doesn't need to be sophisticated. Everybody's trying to, to find and take as much devices as possible. If you would listen on your internet today, you would see that every two minutes, there's a botnet trying to infect you. But the thing is that you talk about all of this data, you know, people spend their lives gathering data. There's so much data out there. How is it we're still missing something? Well, the problem is that there's too much data. So if you're in a security operations center, every day you get like thousands of events. And we have traditional SIM systems, um, security information management systems that allow you to correlate events and bring down the millions of events per day that are detected in our systems to a couple of thousands of events. But as a human being sitting in that SOC, going through the events, a thousand events per day, it's not possible for me to process. So the important is that we have systems that automatically can reduce the number of events to those important events that we need to work on as experts. Tell me a little bit more about Radware and what you're doing and how you're helping deal with this missing data. One of the things that we're doing is looking at building a model of all the usage of services within the public cloud, within your cloud infrastructure, building a model based on the real usage and then from there look at the permissions and make sure that we can enforce the least amount of privileges on every service. In that way you are sure that at least 
your service that you're using are using the least privileged principle and do not overexpose information on the internet and you get less impact from breaches. Another way that we're helping in the domain of machine learning and deep learning, so the traditional machine learning, which is used to track behavior uh, of, of, of traffic, is used, for example, in our web application firewalls. So inside the web application firewall, it's important for an application to make the distinction between a bot and a human. You know, you sometimes you have those CAPTCHAs coming up. So when you go to a website, you have a CAPTCHA, you need to, to click on all the images that contain a bike. Now, knowing that using deep learning, attackers have 98% accuracy to solve that CAPTCHA, which is actually like 40% better than I can do it. When I do it, most of the time I miss it. So CAPTCHAs are not really a good solution to make the distinction between a bot and a human. It's better to do it looking at the behavior of the actor. So if you look at the human behavior, bot behavior will be different. And by tracking that behavior in machine learning, we keep that data. And based on that, we can make the distinction between bots and, and humans. Many organizations will say, <clears throat> we already have a security system in place. So if we change our system, how much disruption is going to be caused? What impact is it going to make on their day-to-day -day business? Well, one of the things about deep learning, uh, as we discussed, you need big amounts of data. And you need to train a model based on that data. You need lots of resources like storage. You need vast amount of compute to calculate from that data and to create your model. And that creation is better done in the cloud because most of the enterprises don't have that infrastructure on site. We put that in the cloud, we calculate a model, and based on that model, we will create intelligence, and that intelligence will then be feedback to the organization. So that means if the organization already has a device on-prem mitigation device, typically they will leverage threat intelligence feeds uh, from the cloud and mitigate it on-prem. So they don't need to change that much. They just need to be able to accept a threat intelligence feed. And by doing so, they will be able to block, for example, attacking IoT devices. On the cloud side, uh, where you have people migrating to the cloud and to have that least privileges, also it doesn't need that much because the infrastructure that has been put up by the cloud provider, let's take Amazon for an example, it's, it's one of the leading cloud providers. So Amazon already put out the infrastructure and in that infrastructure, there's lots of logging. So you have easy access to APIs from Amazon to get all the information of what's happening in your virtual environment. So it's enough for you to create a user with access to those APIs. We can tie in, we can extract the information, process it in our cloud, and then give you the, the, the resulting back and you can make sure that you enforce these privileges on your data. How do you feel about the future? Are you fairly optimistic about the way things are looking when we look at cybersecurity, when we look at machine and deep learning? What do you expect out of the next, say, three to five years? And from the malicious actors, for the next couple of years, it will be mainly an automation. So they will use um, deep learning systems uh, such as AI for natural language processing to scale up phishing attacks because they can download information from the internet, automatically process it, make a phishing email, send that phishing email to the right person, and they can automate that. So automation will be the most important for the attacker landscape. If we think that today we are overwhelmed with security events, I can ensure you that within here and a couple of years, it will be even more as they get more automated. Now looking further out and looking at the applications of AI and machine learning and deep learning, as we get better on the defensive side, the attackers will also get better at the attack side. I can see them at one moment moving from being the actual hacker who is producing the vulnerability and creating the vulnerability to the guy who is actually maintaining the machine. So he's designing the AI system, he's maintaining the AI system, and the AI system will actually find the vulnerabilities automatically and perform the attacks automatically. So he becomes the mechanic of the machine, and all he does is just maintain that machine to automatically keep attacking. And that's the future that we're looking forward to, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the hackers react to the increase in technology, and for that matter, how they use yeah. technology as well. And I guess only time will tell what the landscape will really look like in the next three to five years. Pascal Kienens uh, from Radware, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alistair.